Well, it looks like we have a quorum, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we have a, first of all, welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, we've got a special program for you today. And um, Susan, I think you have a couple slides for me. Um, I don't trust myself to share the screen. Um, can you all see that? <clears throat> so next slide. So today we have an opportunity to honor the, the memory of Craig Brigham, who was a, an all-star here in, in Charlotte. And I came to know Craig during the early part of my career when I was in Baltimore. And at that time, Craig was sort of the go-to spine physician for the professional athletes. And we sent a number of our players from Baltimore down and Craig did a great job. But came to know uh, more of him and his true character and, and what he meant to um, the program here in Charlotte through that process. Um, I want to tell you that, um, that it's, um, it's important that we honor Craig's memory through this lectureship today, but we've also um, agreed to honor his memory on our legacy wall. Um, next slide. So for those of you that grew up in the UPMC or Cleveland Clinic or HSS or Boston Traditions, you know that a large part of the strength of those programs is the, is the legacy that they, they represent and that, that strengthens the folks going forward knowing that the foundation that they're built on. Well, the, the program here in Charlotte is no less impressive when you look back through um, all the great folks that have helped us to get to where we are. And some of you have seen the portrait of Ed Hanley that we have. And, and this is um, one of the things that you notice here, though, is that the wall is relatively empty behind him. Um, it's not empty behind him because there haven't been great folks like Craig Brigham, but um, we're going to fix that. Next slide. So we had the opportunity to honor Mike Bossy um, with a, a portrait as well in December. And these portraits are commissioned by Fred Marshall, who's um, done a great job. Those of you that have seen these portraits, I think, can attest that he's really captured the, um, the spirit of these folks. But we have um, our committee has selected four additional folks to be honored in the Legacy Wall. Um, and Craig Brigham is one of them. Um, so Jim Kellum, um, Jerry Petty, the second neurosurgeon in the state of North Carolina, who really built the, the CNSA group that is a lot of the strength of spine in, in Charlotte now. And then Oscar Miller, who was one of the found, foundational um, legacy members of, of orthopedics in Charlotte that started us off. So I want to thank um, our committee, Walt Beaver, Hunter Dyer, and Jeff Niesel for um, helping me to come up with these names. And I would also encourage all of you to, to speak with, with um, one of the four of us if you have somebody else that you'd like to include um, in this process. Um, Fred's going to be coming to Charlotte to, to sit with, with Jerry Petty. He's also going to fly to Houston to sit with Jim Kellum. And for the folks who are deceased, he'll be using artwork and photographs to come up with their portraits as well. But these will be done in September. So by, by the end of the summer, we should have these up and everybody can, can enjoy them and enjoy the legacy they represent. Next slide. So thank you, Craig. And um, in honor of Craig's memory, um, the color of, of the day for CME today is Oregon green. So Oregon Green will put that in the chat. And, um, with no further ado, I'll turn the program over to um, Dr. Eric Laxer to introduce our guest. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, T. Let me just bring my uh, screen share up here and uh, make sure that everybody can see my uh, images. Does that work for y'all? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you know, uh, as someone who had the privilege of working with Craig and knowing Craig, there's no doubt that he's absolutely uh, deserving of this honor and really what a special time to make this announcement, which is today and the eighth anniversary uh, of his death. And in previous years, we've chosen to celebrate Craig's life and his contributions by hosting a visiting professor who we thought Craig would have enjoyed meeting and, and hearing talk. And uh, before we introduce Dr. Protosaltis, uh, I'm gonna share some of Craig's background for those of you who did not have the privilege, privilege of uh, really, really knowing him. Um, so Craig grew up in Oregon, uh, as Dr. Mormon said, where he did his undergraduate degree at the University of Oregon, uh, followed by his medical school and residency at Northwestern in Chicago. Uh, he did his fellowship in Buffalo before coming to Charlotte 
to join Miller Clinic, which was one of the predecessor groups of uh, Ortho Carolina. He quickly became the section chief for spine and for several years was the main and really only attending for spine with a true dedication to teaching uh, as well as mentorship. And one of the things we can thank Craig for is convincing Dr. Niesel, one of his co-residents, uh, to come join the staff here at Tech Carolina's Medical Center. Uh, Craig was a member of multiple spine society. He became very well known throughout the spine community. And as Dr. Mormon mentioned, he was uh, actually really well known for taking care of professional athletes from, from all walks of life. Uh, Craig also had an incredible athletic background, one which he actually almost never spoke about unless you brought it up with him. Uh, he was a standout high school athlete in gymnastics and track and field. He was the state high school gymnastics champion and his track and field team won back-to-back uh, -back state championships. Uh, he chose to focus on the decathlon. He was a two-time All-American uh, at the University of Oregon, which he attended with a full uh, four-year athletic scholarship. He, he really has too many accomplishments uh, for us to go through here, but just to highlight several of them, uh, he, he placed 13th overall at the 1972 Olympic trials, doing this while he was a, still a 17-year-old high school senior. Uh, he placed 8th in 1976, despite having had a bout of mononucleosis. Uh, he then took two years off from med school to train for the 1980 Olympics, which unfortunately were boycotted by the U.S. government. So he really, despite three attempts, never had an opportunity to compete on a world stage uh, at that level. Uh, despite that, Craig was ranked uh, ninth in the world in 1975, and arguably one of the greatest accomplishments for him was holding the National High School Decathlon record for 37 years, uh, which was finally broken in 2009, which is really an astounding uh, accomplishment. Uh, there's no doubt that Craig's passion was performing and teaching others how to perform spine surgery as well as mentoring residents and fellows, uh, things which he did as well as or better uh, than really just about anyone. His, his main interest in spine was deformity, particularly of the cervical spine. Uh, and this is why Dr. Uh, Protosol, this is an excellent choice for our visiting professor today. So Femi, we thank you very much for, for your time. Uh, Dr. Protosaltis was born in Zimbabwe. He came to the United States at age eight. He did his bachelor's degree at Yale in 1997, followed by his MD in residency at Columbia. He did a fellowship in hand surgery at Duke before doing a spine fellowship uh, in New York. And it's an interesting combination. It has actually allowed him to add peripheral nerve surgery as well as being part of a brachial plexus clinic in New York to his repertoire. Uh, he's the associate, an associate professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Neurosurgery at NYU and he's currently the chief for the division of spine surgery at uh, NYU Langone. He's very prolific. He's had over 170 peer reviewed publications. He's actively involved in multiple spine societies including being a frequent speaker uh, and is uh, on committee and has leader committees and has leadership roles. We first met him in Charlotte in 2015 when he was here as part of a CSRS traveling fellowship group. Uh, he's also scheduled to be an ABC traveling fellow this year, although it sounds like that's been moved to uh, next year. Uh, this photo on the left is in the lobby at Mercy and on the right, you can see is our uh, bioskills lab. And these are some additional photos of his uh, co-fellows as they did several different activities here in Charlotte. So his main interest is cervical spine deformity. His uh, presentation today is going to be on uh, uh, assessment and surgical planning and cervical deformity surgery, how to avoid alignment failures. So uh, Femi, we welcome you and uh, we are excited about your talk. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, it's really an honor to give a talk in memory of uh, Craig Brigham, um, who's a member of two societies that are really important to me, the CSRS and the SRS. Um, and while I never had the privilege of meeting him, uh, I think everything that he stood for, it, is also really important in my life, resident education, fellow education, um, and leaving an uh, important imprint uh, in uh, deformity. Um, and, and it's great to uh, see some familiar faces, some familiar names. Uh, I wish this could be in person. Uh, I had a great time visiting as a traveling fellow for the CSRS uh, and uh, 
you know, wonderful times with Ed Henley, Bruce Darden, uh, Alden Milam, and, and Eric, just to name a few. Um, uh, but hopefully, as things ease up, we can all meet in person one day and exchange ideas and libations uh, in, a, in a more personal setting. Um, but uh, without further ado, I'll uh, move on to my talk. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Excellent. So I'm going to talk about something that um, I find uh, really compelling, uh, and that's my patients with uh, cervical deformity. And I want to talk a little bit about how I approach uh, cervical deformity pa patient and how I do the planning, because I think you really have to be prepared for these cases and you can't um, just wing it. Uh, it's as if you're building a, um, a, a large important building or a large important bridge. You don't want that bridge to crumble. Um, and, and, and with time, you want it to, to persevere and, and maintain itself. So uh, you have to do all the engineering work, the architecture uh, and the planning uh, rather than just winging it in the operating room. And I think that's what I'd like to impress uh, on this talk, that there is a fair amount of planning that I put into these cases. Do have some disclosures. Um, so as an overview of the talk, we'll talk a little bit about measuring baseline deformity, um, what alignment parameters I use. Um, it's, it's important to assess deformity flexibility because uh, then you know what, what you actually need to do in a case and how uh, invasive you need to get. Um, and then I think going through and trying to simulate the correction, simulate what you're going to do to the cervical spine, the, the lordosis change, simulate what you might do across the cervical thoracic junction. Um, and there's planning softwares that you can use, or you can just take a piece of paper and cut it like in the old fashioned way. That's basically what those planning softwares do. Um, or once you get good with geometry, you can just kind of map out some angles on a pack system. Um, plan your LIV, and there's a lot that goes into that. And then anticipate that at the distal junction, there's gonna be a change in the angle. Just like if you're doing a thoracolumbar deformity, there's gonna be a change in the proximal angle. And then what you have to do is once you've got all your correction mapped out, then you have to try to figure out where the pelvic tilt's gonna sit for that spine alignment, and whether that all makes sense at the end in terms of a global picture. Um, and at the end, uh, I think you also need to figure out what you're going to do about DJK and DJF, distal junctional kyphosis, distal junctional failure. Some amount of kyphosis at the distal junction is expected, but if it's excessive and it can be a failure, then it can completely eliminate everything that you set out to do in the, in the case. And then finally, you just have to execute it and, and try to measure it intraoperatively and, and confirm that you got what you wanted. So first, let's talk a little bit about parameters and, and x-rays. Um, this is the, um, the AIMS um, ISSG classification of uh, cervical deformity. Um, and, and what this basically set, it, set to do was similar to the SRF Schwab classification, we try to introduce key parameters that, that we were looking at. Um, and at this point, 2015, that's when, right when I was doing my traveling fellowship, that's when this was all fresh. Um, we tried to kind of mimic the SRS Schwab classification. So we threw a bunch of parameters down, just like SRS Schwab has three important parameters. Um, we figured that CSVA was important, the chin brow vertical angle was important, and T1 slope minus cervical lordosis, like the analog of pelvic incidence minus lumbar lordosis in the thoracolumbar deformity, was also going to be important. And then we added a caveat, and that was um, understanding whether or not the patients were also myelopathic. Um, but that being said, this is kind of a Baroque way of approaching deformity. And maybe not all these parameters are really critical in every case. Maybe in some cases they are, and in many cases they're not. So uh, rather than measuring a million parameters every single time you, you sit down to, to look at a deformity, maybe it's important to kind of understand the, the type of deformity is and then measure the parameter that's most important for that. So this is kind of what that deformity system looks like. And you can tell it's kind of complex and there's modifiers with severity, but those were all mostly based on expert opinion and not necessarily tagged to real disability measures, which is a whole different talk, whether or not we have appropriate disability measures for cervical deformity. So how can we simplify this approach? And I've spent uh, the ensuing years trying to figure out how to become more simple uh, so that it's a little bit more palatable to the average person, the average surgeon, 
on approaching cervical deformity. Well, let me introduce a parameter that I think is really important, and that's the T1 slope. And take this paper um, on laminoplasties. Um, back in 2013, uh, they said that T1 slope predicted postoperative kyphotic alignment after um, laminoplasty. So the higher the T1 slope is, the more likely you were to get a kyphotic postoperative alignment, which is problematic in the setting of myelopathy because then you don't get drift back of the cord and you can have persistent myelopathic symptoms, maybe not as good a recovery as you'd hope. Um, so you can tell that something's happening here with T1 slope that, that's important. Um, we did a paper years ago uh, that showed that if, if you presented surgeons that like to do cervical deformity with just the cervical cassette, just the next of the cervical spine, and you asked them to plan out what type of surgery they do for a patient. And then you presented them with a full spine x-ray of the same patient, 58%, almost two thirds of the, pe of the people would change their plans for longer fusions. Um, so I think T1 slope is really important. It's the tip of the iceberg. It's telling you what's happening in the subjacent level. So if you're focused on a cervical case, you're focused on someone that's got maybe myelopathy, that's got some kind of focal kyphosis in the cervical region, but you see that there's a high T1 slope, that should be an indicator that, wait a minute, I need to take a step back. I need to get a full spine x-ray on this patient. Way back in 2007, this, this uh, paper by Knott and colleagues showed that T1 slope higher than 25 degrees was associated with high C7 SVA, so more than 10 centimeters. So it's telling you there may be underlying correct lumbar deformity. And then we, we also looked at this um, uh, recently and, and showed that a T1 slope over 30 degrees um, really should indicate that we should get full spine radiographs because it either means that you have a high thoracic kyphosis, which is gonna be problematic uh, for, for choosing a lower instrumented vertebra in a cervical deformity, or you have high um, global parameters of thoracolumbar deformity, which may, may require that you address uh, more than one region of the spine uh, in a staged fashion potentially like this example, a patient with high T1 slope and basically a dropped head. But if you look at the full spine, there's kind of like a, a global increase in thoracolumbar deformity in the case. So I try to make it simple again. And so I, I focused on two areas of the spine, the top of the cervical spine and the T1 slope when I'm just looking at a, a cervical spine. And we can create three kind of caveat categories. Um, and think about T C2. C2 is really important because if it's vertical, like it is in normal people, um, then you have the full range of motion for occipital cervical motion uh, between occiput and C2. You can look up, you can look down, uh, and there's no limitation. But as C2 tilts forward, then you start eating into your extension reserve and you can't look up as well. And that's the main complaint in cervical deformity patients that they can't look up, obviously. They can't maintain horizontal gaze. They certainly can't look up towards the top of the stairs when they're climbing the stairs. Um, so take the first caveat, a low C2 tilt, high T1 slope patient. Well, this patient has a very high T1 slope, but they have good cervical compensation. So they're, they're creating a hyperlordotic situation. So they're well compensated and they're able to make their C2 vertical. That patient's deformity is gonna be in the upper thoracic spine, as you can see in the full spine x-ray here. Take another caveat, a patient with a high C2 tilt and a low T1 slope. Uh, now this patient's deformity is gonna be entirely in the cervical region. So you don't really have to worry about the full spine, but you, you know, if I'm doing a deformity case, I do end up getting the full spine uh, image and we have um, a stereotactic radiographic image uh, in, a, in, our, in our clinic, the EOS machine, uh, that allows me to, to take a full spine, full body if I want to, uh, image of a patient, which is kind of a standard of uh, every patient that comes to my office. And it's low dose x ray, so um, it's basically the equivalent of a, a regional film. Um, and then you can see in the full spine film that this patient really doesn't have thoracolumbar deformity. And in fact, in a lot of cases, they have a lot of compensation and flattening of their upper thoracic spine, flattening um, uh, of their lower thoracic spine, uh, hyperlordosis of the lumbar spine, and in some cases, 
depending on what they can generate in their, in their spine, they also have pelvic retroversion. The final category is the people with both high C2 tilt and high T1 slope. And those patients are the most problematic because again, they have deformity potentially in both regions, like that example I showed you earlier. Um, and you really have to figure out, well, okay, the primary complaint here is cervical, and he's got a dropped head. But where you stop and, and where you choose your lower instrument or vertebra is going to be really important. And, um, and then whether or not the patient also needs an additional thoracolumbar uh, surgery is also something that you may need to plan out. So we have all these parameters. And, and if, you're, if you're thinking about thoracolumbar deformity, there's a million parameters. But again, I, I like to make things really simple. And one thing, one way I simplify things in my, when I approach a cervical deformity patient is I just measure one parameter for thoracolumbar deformity. And that's the T1 pelvic angle. Uh, and this angle more or less tells me within a range whether or not there's a significant thoracolumbar deformity. And, um, and then as a, as a, if you think about the spine, like the splines of a fan, um, opening and closing, the more open the fan is, the more deformed the patient is, the more straight forward they are, the more closed the fan is, the tighter they are, you can kind of create the spoke that, con that contributes to the cervical alignment which uh, I've published and, and called the CTPA, the cervical thoracic pelvic angle. And that's just the component that contributes to the cervical spine measured from the femoral neck. And there's advantages of this spoke approach to assessing deformity. And that is, uh, first of all, the T1 pelvic angle, which is published in Jamie Jess uh, back in 2014, is, is kind of like a way of assessing spinal deformity separate from pelvic compensation. So while, pelvic tilt and T1 spinal pelvic inclination are part of this angle. Um, what it's basically telling you is what the deformity is separate from the pelvic retroversion. Uh, and it was shown to be a good substitute for the SRS swab classification in a way uh, if you wanted one parameter because it in includes information from both SVA and pelvic tilt simultaneously. It's not telling you how, how good a, a compensatory response the patient is initiating but it is telling you how deformed the patient is separate from the composition, which I think is really helpful. Uh, so look at this case of a patient with a bad thoracolumbar deformity feeding a cervical malalignment. So the CSVA is increased, the SVA, the C7 SVA is increased, um, and the patient's not really retroverting, not compensating. Now, as she's maximum compensated, those plumb line measures are smaller. And if you're just looking at the cervical spine, you might be fooled into thinking that this patient has no deformity. And if you maximally compensate and totally retrovert your pelvis, you can, you can almost get a negative C7 SVA. So SVAs and plumb lines aren't telling you the whole story. You really have to assess plumb lines along with uh, pelvic retroversion as well. But the advantage of the CSVA, uh, the CTPA and the TPA is that you're looking at the same parameter through different amounts of compensation. So it's pretty useful. Um, so again, let's go back to those caveats, the three caveats. This is the uh, low um, T1, the, the low T1 slope, high C2 tilt patient. You can see the TPA is, is low, it's under 20. That, that patient doesn't have thoracolumbar deformity. All the deformities in the cervical region. Take the patient with the high T1 slope, and that's an elevated TPA over 30 is elevated. And um, the CTPA is, is marginal because uh, basically because of the T1 slope being so high, uh, even though there's good compensation, there's kind of like a cervical deformity in this patient. Um, but really the, the deformity apex is in the upper thoracic spine, as you can see. And then this patient with deformity in both regions has elevated TPAs and CTPAs. Um, so again, thinking about the spine like the spokes of a fan uh, or wheel. Um, but Let's make it even more simple. And, and I showed you the caveats. T1 slope is an important parameter. Another important parameter for me is the C2 slope. And I mentioned the C2 tilt earlier. C2 slope is basically the same thing, but because our in our database of um, deformity, um, we have slopes, not tilts of the vertebra. Um, we, I, I was able to publish um, the angles based on the C2 slope instead of the C2 tilt, but in my opinion, really, it's the tilt that really is determining um, where, where that uh, spine is positioned. But 
you can think about it analogously as uh, the slope also being important. So in this uh, study of 104 patients, um, we looked at CT slope and, and the higher it was, the more it correlated with health outcome measures, disability measures, particularly in the post-op patients. So it's, it's not such a strong correlation preoperatively when the patients don't have fusions, but if, and, and there are different morphotypes that have been published and you can look up Lafage, JBJS for the morphotypes in the spine, but those are really asymptomatic individuals. And some of them do have high C2 slopes. Um, but if you fuse a patient with a high C2 slope, they're not gonna be happy because you've taken away significant compensation in the subaxial spine. And now you fix them with a forward leaning C2 slope and they're not gonna be very happy with that. So once you create a fusion, then you really can assess patients with the C2 slope. And our logistic regression model showed that the ones over 20 degrees correlated to the higher disability. So try to aim for CT slopes that are um, 20 or better, 20 or less um, uh, when you're doing fusions. Um, and, you know, I mentioned earlier, um, the CT slope, T1 slope, I think these are two really important parameters. When they're, when, when they're, the C2 slope is high and the T1 slope is low, deformity is entirely in the cervical spine. And in, in, the, in the AIMS classification, remember there was a T1 slope minus cervical lordosis parameter, which is, was like the pelvic incidence lumbar lordosis. The problem with it, part, part of the problem with it is that pelvic incidence is a fixed parameter. So you can really be a detective about recreating lordosis in a patient who's lost it with spondylosis or iatrogenic clapback. But T1 slope is a moving target. It can vary based on how much compensation the patient has, how strong they are, um, how good their muscle quality is, uh, whether they're flexible or not, um, whether you do a fusion to change it. So there's lots of ways that you, the T1 slope can change. Um, but uh, the other issue with that parameter is you're measuring three angles when really it amounts to one angle and that's C2 slope because this is just basic geometry. Uh, Algebra, let's say, um, T1 slope minus cervical lordosis is basically mathematically T1 slope minus the subtraction of C2 slope from C7 slope. And if you think about it, the C T1 slope and C7 slope are basically about the same in most patients. So you can cross those out and what you have left is C2 slope, which is basically like the C2 tilt, right? That we were talking about earlier. So rather than doing this, these three measurements, just measure C2 slope. And that's telling you how forward inclined C2 is. That's telling you how much compensation the patient has. And then when you couple that with an understanding of what the T1 slope is, those are the two parameters you really need to know in cervical deformity. I will say that CSVA is also kind of a critical parameter because it's also been shown uh, to correlate health with health outcomes in post-operative patients as well. So again, if you fuse patients with a high CSVA, that's problematic and those patients don't do well. But invariably, those patients also have high C2 slope. It's very rare to be able to get the uh, C2 slope uh, to be straight and have a high CSVA. Uh, so the two kind of go hand in hand. So for me, it's just three parameters that I'm measuring, C2 slope, T1 slope, and T1 pelvic angle, which tells me quick and dirty if there's a significant thoracolumbar deformity. So now that we, we've kind of tackled the radiographs, there's the patient. Let's not forget about the patient. And I think you really have to sit down with the patient, talk to them and ask them what's really bothering them. They'll come in, into the room. Some of them are, are very deformed, chin on chest. That's obvious. Um, so, but some of them have subtle issues. They're not happy that they've been fused forward. Um, they're not happy that they can't look up. I had a lawyer who worked for an airline industry and his main complaint was that he couldn't look at the airplanes. So talk to the patient, also discuss swallowing because it's, it's more common than you think preoperative dysphagia, whether or not the patients have had anterior cervical surgery. Many of them have a baseline amount of dysphagia and whether that's because their necks are forward, because their necks are, are spondylotic or fixed in a position that doesn't, that's not conducive to swallowing. Um, you know, the, if they can't generate the movement of the cervical spine, it's difficult for them to, to allow the esophageal wave of muscle to pull the food down. So discuss swallowing with them because you'd be surprised how many of them have difficulty. Um, and then do an, a thorough exam. And it comes down to really good thorough neurologic uh, evaluation, 
assess weakness, especially especially intrinsic muscles. Um, definitely do the reflexes. You know, don't miss myelopathy. Take the shoes off. Examine the Babinskis, and very very important. Watch them walk. Watch them get out of a chair. Assess their frailty. I mean, this is so critical because you don't want to operate on the extremely frail individual because you're basically going to put them through a huge surgery with huge risk. And if they're not suitable, if they're not strong enough to, to sustain this major insult from what your surgery is going to impart in them, then they're not really going to do very well after surgery. It's going to take them a very long time to get better. And they really should probably be optimized in a way that in, includes their primary doctor prehab uh, and nutrition optimization. Um, and then in assessing them, lay them flat. Lay them flat on the table and then come back five minutes later and see how flexible that deformity gets as, they, as they're laying flat, because that'll help you understand under anesthesia what's going to happen with Gardner Wells traction, what might happen with the Mayfield bites. He's doing his the presentation thing and I didn't miss it. It's awesome. I'm sorry, you somehow inadvertently muted. Can you hear me now? <clears throat> yes. Okay, great. So I think supine films are really important, whether that's a plain radiograph, a CT or, or an MRI. And it, if you're getting CTs, ask them to do one sagittal view that includes the, um, the cervical and the thoracic spine if you're planning a cervical to thoracic fusion or and even ask them to get a scalp that includes the pelvis as well so that you can assess the entire spine in the supine position that can be really helpful so make a relationship with your radiologist put it in the requisition and then you'll you'll see that this pays dividends because you're measuring alignment uh in the in the most flexible position and then what are you going to measure with with a supine film i mean can you measure an sva when the patient's laying down probably but you also have to assess the um the tilt uh, of the pelvis as well. Uh, you can measure the spinal pelvic angles we talked about, uh, the TPA for thoracic lumbar deformity or the CTPA. Um, but if you're really, if you're gonna do a fusion, say from C2 to T10, it makes the most sense to measure something between C2 and T10. And rather than measuring just the Cobb angle, measure something that gives you sagittal alignment. And we're publishing these angles. Again, it's not so important to me memorize a million angles you're just trying to figure something out with a reference point. So for me, a reference point is the back of the vertebral body of the lower instrumented vertebra, and then a centroid to centroid line. That's telling me how forward inclined C2 is relative to my LIV. And I know that if I get it straight enough, then the patient's head will be balanced over the pelvis as they walk and, and do their activities of life. Um, so this is, for example, the C2 T1 tilt. So the vertical line along the back of the vertebral body of T1 and a centroid to centroid line, it's telling me how forward inclined. It's kind of like an, a CSVA, but it's referenced off of the back of a vertebral body. So it's kind of independent of positioning so that you can help, this helps you with planning and something that you can measure intraoperatively where you can't measure a CSVA intraoperatively because just tilting the bed changes the CSVA like we showed you in the, in the compensation uh, um, x-ray. Um, and so this is kind of, this is how I plan my surgeries. This, this right here, if there's one take home slide, just take a look at this slide. Uh, this is an example patient, someone who had a, a, a cervical trauma, C7 burst fracture. And you know, when you, when you go to do a, a posterior fusion for say a fracture, there's, a, there's this, this um, tendency or this desire to position the patient such that there's no wrinkles in the skin and you can open the facets and decorticate them and put your screws in easily. And so a kyphotic alignment on the table is usually what, what accommodates that the best. But if you don't reposition that head before dropping the rods then the patients are gonna be fixed like this in kyphotic alignment. And, um, and that's a terrible way for them to go about life and they're gonna be extremely unhappy so when you go to plan a surgery, a corrective surgery on a patient like this, 
first think about where you might do your osteotomy. Um, so in a fusion, you're that crosses the cervical thoracic junction, your options are limited. In a, in a fusion that doesn't cross the cervical thoracic junction, if there's an open anterior disc space, if I can get to it because the sternum or the clavicle are low enough that I have access, I'll go in the front, I'll remove the uncle vertebral joints. That's extremely destabilizing. And then in the back, take out the superior and inferior facet processes, a posterior column osteotomy. And that's basically a three column osteotomy where I'm able to lengthen the anterior column and shorten the posterior column. It's friendly for the neural elements. It doesn't com compress the foramina um, and that can be really advantageous. But in a case where there's a fusion that crosses the cervical thoracic junction, you're really looking at a three column osteotomy. So map out where you're gonna do the osteotomy and always try to go close to the apex of the deformity. If you do a three column osteotomy in a region of the spine that's not deformed, it's not gonna have as big an impact. But if you go right at the apex of the kyphosis, then it's really gonna have a huge impact. Um, and so uh, uh, next you wanna map out your correction. So I like to use simulated software. I have my, my fellows plan out these deformities with simulated software. But again, if, you, if you're good at doing it, you can just do it on the packs and guesstimate where the spine's gonna go basically. Um, alternatively, you could just print out the x-ray and then just get an old fashioned scissors and cut it and make the spine straight and figure out what the angle needs to be. Um, and I think it's, again, it's really important to get the supine imaging. Look at the MRI. You probably already have the MRI. You're probably gonna get a CT scan, ask them to do the CT that includes cervical and thoracic spine all together if you're going to the lower thoracic spine and then measure some something. Um, I offered that C2 LIV angle, um, the tilt. Uh, so measure something that allows you to, to plan um, how much correction you're gonna get so that you can measure it intraoperatively. So here's mapping out uh, a PSO at, at the apex of the deformity in this case. And, and then try to anticipate what's gonna happen distally, right? So definitely um, pick an LIV, a lower instrumented vertebra that's neutral, that's not kyphotic. Um, measure something that you're gonna follow intraoperatively. So I mentioned those parameters, the C2 slope, T1 slope, CSVA, TPA, those are my go-tos. And then something like C2 LIV tilt that you can measure intraoperatively. But then you wanna anticipate what's gonna happen underneath your fusion. And this is the part that is difficult and that people don't necessarily think about, um, but it's so critical because you can expect that there'll be more kyphosis right below your fusion, distal junctional kyphosis change. You can expect that the patients won't have as much lumbar lordosis because believe it or not, as spondylatic as some of them may be, they're actually giving their best effort to stand up straight. And, and whatever the effort they're giving, will probably be less so postoperatively, especially in the first six weeks, but even out later, especially if you correct them significantly. So in some ways, you may have to overshoot a little with some of your corrections. Um, and also you may have to anticipate that the patients may have less pelvic tilt. And you can predict what the distal junctional kyphosis changes. And we just, we did a study recently that we're gonna try to publish very soon, um, looking at the entire an international spine study group data set of cervical deformities. We divided them two thirds, one third. We developed a model in two thirds of them and then checked them in the other third. And basically we were able to create a regression model that predicted what exactly the distal junctional kyphosis angle change would be with a pretty decent R value and pretty decent predictability. And what were the parameters that went into what the post-operative distal junctional angle was? And, and keep in mind, if that angle gets over 20 degrees, that's problematic. And, the, and that'll erode your CSVA correction entirely. So you'll put the patient through a huge surgery and then the distal junctional kyphosis change will completely eliminate all the correction you did. So what goes into it? You'd think cervical lordosis would go into it and it does, but look at the cor correlation coefficient. If you change the cervical lordosis, it's a 0.123 correlation coefficient for how much it impacts the distal junctional angle change. How about the change in the total construct? That also, um, that, that parameter I showed you, the change in C2 to the LIV, um, that, that change is also important and three times as important as the change in cervical lordosis. But the most important factor is what the distal junctional kyphosis angle was preoperatively. 
So don't stop at an area that's kyphotic because if you stop in an area that's already 15 degrees kyphotic, guess what? It's gonna get even more kyphotic post-operatively. So that's the most important parameter followed by the change in the construct um, alignment and then the cervical lordosis change. So planning your surgery, let's, uh, let's, let's map it out. So measure, I measure C2 pelvic angle because I, I wanna understand where the pelvic tilt needs to be. And their formula is published for what the pelvic tilt is gonna be for a given T1 pelvic angle or for you know potentially given SVA or something like that. So you can look them up, but, but what's more precise in a cervical deformity is what the C2 pelvic angle is. That's what really determines the pelvic tilt. Uh, so I measure the C2 pelvic angle first. Next, I simulate my osteotomy. So I make my correction, whatever I think I need in order to get um, the spine into a better alignment. And then I simulate that distal junctional kyphosis angle change. So I plug my numbers into my formula and I can anticipate how much kyphosis I'm gonna get right below my LIV, which in this case was T10. And then I change the pelvic tilt to match the C2 pelvic angle based on this formula here that shows you that the parameters that go into determining pelvic tilt are pelvic incidence, but also the global alignment, most importantly. So that's what kind of determines it. But again, you know, most people stand, want to stand, like given an average pelvic incidence of 55, they want to stand with a pelvic tilt of about 20. <coughs> so if your C2 pelvic angle is about 20, then the head's going to be right over the pelvis with the, am the amount of pelvic tilt that you want. So after you do all this correcting and anticipating distal junctional kyphosis angle change. If you just tilt the pelvis to 20, you can see if you've still left some alignment on the table in your plan. And then you have to execute. So finally, it's the, the step that you need to take to execute it. And that's doing the surgery and confirming that you, that you made your plan. And, it, and this is a great osteotomy classification by Ames. Um, for cervical deformity. There's a Schwab classification for thoracolumbar deformity. This is a little bit extra. So it's got a few extra categories um, because of what we do. So in, in, in grades one, there are just regular facet preparation for fusion and regular ACDF can loosen up the spine. But if you wanna loosen it even more, remove the superior and inferior articulating processes in the back, do a posterior column. If you wanna take an extra step in destabilizing, do a cervical corpectomy, but not resecting the uncle vertebral joints. That's a grade three. If you really want to destabilize it, take out the uncle vertebral joints and you don't even have to remove the vertebral body. It's very destabilizing on its own, uh, much more so than a corpectomy uh, because those joints can be locked and that's can, that can be what uh, prevents um, corrections. A grade five is like the osteoclases of as described by Smith Peterson for ankylosing spondylitis, we don't usually do these. Um, grade sixes are the PSOs, which in the cervical spine at C7, you're limited by the geometry. The vertebra is only so tall, um, say 15, 20 millimeters. So the geometry limits how much correction you're going to get, maybe tops 20 degrees, um, which is why, you know, doing a grade four, uh, removing the uncus and then taking out the facets in the back lengthens the anterior column, shortens the posterior column is actually more, more powerful. And so as a result of the, the limitation of PSOs in the upper thoracic or cervical spine, I've moved to doing VCRs, um, posterior based VCRs when I have fusions that cross the junction. Um, and that way I can get end plate, end plate contact with the cage and I can really position the spine where I need to. Uh, I'm gonna go through a case example uh, if, there's, if time's permitting. Um, here's a case of a patient with a fixed cervical deformity. Um, she had had a prior fusion um, for scoliosis that resulted in uh, a, a PJK and the PJK was attempted to be corrected with the fusion up to the T1, but um, she kyphosed above that. So she's had recurrent PJF uh, and, and now has basically very forward sagittal alignment, very unhappy um, with her position with all the surgeries she's had. And you can see here how forward inclined her cervical spine is. T1 slopes really high. Um, Close-up view showing uh, a remnant of her Harrington rod at the bottom. 
uh, and an attempt to correct the PJF, which resulted in a recurrent PJF. Um, and flexion extension x-rays, which are only so helpful in, in a dropped head case, you, you do also want to look at supine imaging like a CT or an MRI. And be careful with CT, sometimes the, the tech will prop them up maximally for comfort. But in an MRI, they really shove them in the tube. So the MRI is often a lot better uh, indi indicative of, of, of what's happening. But you can see um, here uh, a prior uh, T4 v, uh, PSO that was attempted, um, but again, unsuccessfully realigned the spine. And if, if possible, maybe even ask for the, the sagittal um, MRI to be to include the entire spine or at least the cervical and thoracic region to understand where the deformity is because you can get fooled with just just a view of the cervical spine. Um, and so then measuring this very high CSVA uh, over four centimeters is too high uh, based on Ames's work. Very high C2 slope. Again, we want, we want that number to be under 20 if possible. Um, the T1 slope is extremely high, 60. Again, well above the parameter that we talked about um, 30 degrees. Uh, so what do we do? And, and, and I think in this case, you're pretty limited in what, what the options are. And I chose the, the VCR. And this is some of the work uh, published by Ames and colleagues, 11 PSO patients for cervical corrections. And most of these were done at C7. Um, and they, they ended up with quite a few um, C8 palsies and intrinsic muscle weaknesses. And, and Ames subsequently moved the PSO location down to T2 as a go-to place. So it's outside of the cervical roots. And that's what I planned in, in this particular case of T2 VCR. Um, expandable cages just make it a little bit easier and you could still get great fusion around them. Um, you don't have to sacrifice a nerve root to get that cage in, which I like. Uh, and I planned a C2 to T10 correction. It's used all the way up to C2 because it's got great anchorage and I can get a laminar screw in addition to two pars or two pedicle screws and add a, an additional third rod to stiffen the construct and prevent a failure. Um, I was telling Eric, actually, I had my first failure of C2 fixation in, in this method um, and that I had to correct it last night. Uh, so that was a little bit of a marathon. Um, but here's the intraoperative um, uh, surgery uh, case. And th this is that parameter I mentioned. So trying to get that parameter close enough so that on the simulation, it makes sense. Uh, this is how I check my correction intraoperatively. And then postoperatively, you can see two months, you're standing up nice and straight. Again, that parameter is close to what it was measured intraoperatively. Um, there's always a little bit of a forward lean, probably because the rods are somewhat flexible, you lose a little bit of correction at the PSO as, th as things subside a little bit. Um, but if you have good um, support, these things will persevere out beyond multiple years as, as they did in this particular case. Um, and uh, you can see the pre to post comparison and the parameters again are, are much improved with a lower CSVA, improved C2 slope. The T1 slope is still a little elevated, but overall the global correction is significant and the clinical picture says the story. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and open it up to some questions if that's okay with everyone. Hey, Femi, it's uh, Tony Kwan. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, Tony. Good to see you. Tony Kwan was uh, my chief resident uh, at Columbia. So uh, lots of good times as we, we tried to figure out spine surgery together. Uh, <laughs> great background. So I'm glad to see, uh, you know, the efforts back then of, uh, you know, proven fruitful. Uh, hopefully get you out to Miami in a couple of weeks. So just keep that on your calendar. Uh, but anyways, um, how often are you using preoperative traction? So um, uh, I, 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 I did it a few times and, and to be honest with you, I was underwhelmed with um, what, what the uh, value of it is. Um, so early in my career, you know, especially if I saw something that was somewhat rigid, I would put the patient in preoperative traction, um, but it's not well tolerated by the patients. The insurance companies can frequently give you a hard time. And uh, at the end of the day, I think what you get with anesthesia and relaxation from anesthesia is a lot more significant. Um, in some cases, these patients develop sternocleidomastoid contractures. And uh, I, had, I had another case that I didn't want to present because of the time constraint, but I actually did a 
sternocleidomastoid release of the um, sternal head of the SCM, uh, leaving the clavicular head. And that's usually what you can feel is really tight in some cases. So if you put them, if you're doing an anterior posterior, you put them in, in the Gardner Wells traction and you feel that band of tissue there, just a little snip of the uh, sternal head uh, is enough to, in, in a lot of cases, do the entire correction. And, I, and that's what you're really trying to overcome with traction is, is some of the muscle contractures that these patients develop. So I'm much more in favor of just putting them under anesthesia. And if I'm doing an anterior posterior, uh, snipping a little bit of the sternal head of the SCM. Hey, Tammy, it's uh, Eric. That, that was really a great talk. Obviously, there are a lot of technical decisions that go into planning everything out. You, you know, there's a lot of overlap in that conceptually uh, because other areas of orthopedics are also doing a lot of advanced planning. Question for you from a training point of view. So is your expectation that the, the fellow and the residents will do all that planning ahead of time? How do you how do you use that aspect of what you do from an educational perspective with uh, each of those different types of trainees? So we, we have a little bit of a program for our fellows. I mean, I think this might be beyond um, what a, a resident really needs to understand and comprehend. Um, but um, I think it's important for them to, to get used to playing with software. And, and that, that, that comes intuitively to the young generation. Uh, if I can include myself in some kind of old generation, given that I never had a cell phone before, you know, say uh, college. Um, so um, I would say that, um, you know, they, they just going through the effort of planning something is helpful for them because they're, they're kind of starting to see what they need to do. Um, and then we, we introduced the concept slowly over time. So we, we measure our, our T1 pelvic angle every single conference so that we can kind of dissect what the spinal deformity is separate from the compensation. And it's amazing. You'll pick up patients that come in stoop forward and it has nothing to do with the spine because if they measure the TPA and it's normal, it's 20 degrees, it's really that their hips are contracted, you know, and, and that's the major issue. Or that if they have a hip replacement, I saw a patient recently whose hip was hip cup was so anniverted that there was no ability for the patient to generate retroversion of the pelvis. And uh, it's hard to explain to them, listen, it's not your spine that's making you lean forward. You got to go back to a hip surgeon and he's got to fix this cup because it doesn't make sense. They're walking around with back pain from leaning forward all day and it has nothing to do with their spine. So I think they can start to understand these concepts. And so we introduce a little bit at a time. Uh, cervical deformity is certainly quite complex. So for that kind of case, you know, I, if we have one coming up, we'll go through it with them. Um, but because it's less common in thoracolumbar deformity, we focus on that in our conferences. It's uh, Tony again, Demi. Have you like identified any like risk factors for, you know, kind of post-op distal junctional failure? Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, you know, pre-op kind of identifying the LIV and so forth is you know, really helpful from a planning perspective. But, you know, kind of post-op, like what have you seen as far as, you know, who are kind of the so-called risk factors for these, you know, DJ K failures. Yeah, so um, I have a whole talk about DJK. Um, and uh, I can tell you that, you know, recently we've been looking at the CT scan. So frequently we have CT scans on all our patients uh, preoperatively. Um, and we measure the Hounsfield units. And a fellow of ours did a study last year looking at Hounsfield units. And like, for example, at, at L1, if it's less than 130 uh, mean, um, that's a patient that's at risk of having a mechanical failure. And frequently you'll see some, and they're in the 60s, they've never had a metabolic workup. You gotta push the brakes at that point, get them evaluated. If they qualify, get them on an anabolic parathyroid hormone agent and optimize their bone health. And depending on how weak their bone is, like negative 3.5 T-score, you may wanna wait six months uh, with those anabolic agents before you actually operate and then continue them uh, for the, the three to six month post-operatively of the fusion maturing so that they get the maximum benefit of that medication. You'll see anecdotal studies that are popping up in the literature that, it, that they enhance fusion, that they diminish mechanical failures. And I think it's 
absolutely 100% true. But taking a step back and, and optimizing their bone health is important. And if they have cancer, like my patients yesterday does, uh, then it's problematic because they can't go on those agents and they may have to go on something like polio. Um, uh, and they're, they're just not as good, which is problematic. And then the other part of distal junctional kyphosis is anticipating it. So like, like I said, don't stop in an area that's kyphotic because that's what really determines postoperatively how much kyphosis you're going to end up with. Um, and also uh, look at the CT for flowing osteophytes. They can be protective or if there was a prior fusion mass, don't go all the way to the bottom of the fusion mass. Stop a little short of it, um, so to speak, or if they have an ankylosis or dish, um, leave a couple of segments that are fused below because they're protective as well. Other questions or, or comments? I, I would just add, uh, Femi, thank you very much. We know you're busy. We know you had a long day yesterday. We certainly appreciate your time and your, uh, and your expertise in sharing that with us here today. Um, with that, uh, I'll turn it back to Dr. Mormon for any final comments. Yeah, I would like to add my, my thanks, um, Femi. Um, fantastic lecture. I, um, it's a little above my head in sports medicine, so I um, can't add a whole lot, but appreciate your expertise in teaching us what you've taught us and, and your time um, to be with us. Um, with that, we'll, we'll finish up Grand Rounds. Um, I will remind folks that in, in two weeks, we have Dr. Komen coming as a um, part of the chair exchange with Wake Forest, and otherwise, we'll see you next week. We will try to do a limited um, in-person um, Grand Rounds for Komen's visit. Um, but we'll stay on Zoom until that point. I'm excited to hear that our governor is opening up our state in June. So I um, look forward to seeing you all in person um, soon and, and partially in May, and then hopefully we'll get back to normal um, this summer. So everybody have a great week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again. Thanks, Demi. Thanks, Demi.